another successful mission. Hey, I couldn't have done it without you, pal. What's all this racket? Oh, hey, Brian. Uh, Spencer and I just helped out a teacher with some active learning strategies. Active learning? We didn't need active learning back in my day. We just lectured and the students listened. And that's the way it should be. Well, Brian, you know what the studies... Studies? What you need is real evidence like this article from my school newspaper. Local teacher teaches? Active learning, active learning. You should just lecture and lecture till you lose your voice. I wonder if Brian's lecture style was really the best strategy. Spencer, I have an idea. Why don't we use the time travel transporter to go back and watch Brian teach? That sounds really fun. Let me set the date for 1985. Are you ready? Let's do it. Welcome to Launch Your Classroom. I'm Kyle Pope. What was your favorite class when you were a student? Not your favorite subject, but your favorite class. I loved the topic of world history, but the most exciting class for me was biology. Why? Because instead of passively listening to a long lecture or completing a worksheet, I got to interact with the lesson through experiments. Now, it's been a while since I was a pupil, but students today still need to be engaged in order to maximize their learning. Perhaps even more so as we now live in a world where entertainment is readily available on many devices. A lecture alone will simply no longer keep their attention. So as teachers, we must adapt and be willing to use active learning strategies to turn our students into eager participants who are invested in the learning material. Today on Launch Your Classroom, we're going to take a look at engaging your students through interaction. Let's get right to our first active learning strategy, polling. One of the easiest ways to get your students quickly interacting with your lesson is through the use of polling. At its core, a poll allows every student to come up with a response instead of only one or two getting the opportunity. There are many ways to conduct a poll and many reasons to do so. So we're going to provide you with three useful examples. Number one, digital polling. Many free to use polling apps exist and only require the use of a computer and an electronic device. For this digital poll, let's ask a predictive question to get our students engaged in the lesson. Yesterday, we found out that Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn took an oath to never tell what they witnessed. Do you think they'll be able to keep their promise? Take out your phones and join the poll. It looks like most of you think that both will keep their oath. Well, today we're gonna find out. Digital polling is a great way to use student phones for learning, but perhaps you don't have access to enough devices. If that's the case, there are other options like number two, dry erase boards. These boards are very inexpensive, reusable, and many schools already have them available for your use. Let's use them to check to see how students are doing midway through the lesson. I know you're all working hard, but I want to see how you're feeling about some of the questions. If you're sure you know the answer, draw a smiley face. If you're not sure, draw a thinking face. Okay, question one. Great, all smiley faces. All right, how about question two? All right, I see some thinking faces. No problem, that is a tough question. Let's work through it together. Dry erase boards provide an easy method for the teacher to take a poll for immediate feedback. But perhaps you don't have dry erase boards readily available. If that's the issue, there's always number three, voting with your feet. You don't need any materials for this poll and it's very easy to do even with little planning. In this example, we want to get our students thinking critically about the material. Okay, let's take a quick class poll. Who do you believe was more responsible for the Trojan War, Paris or Menelaus? If you think Paris, go to this side of the room. If you think Menelaus, go to that side of the room. And go. Getting students up and moving is an excellent way to get students re-engaged and thinking about your curriculum topic. 
Whichever of the three polling methods you use, they will all lead to active learning. So start designing some polls and get all of your students involved in your lessons. One of the biggest questions veteran teachers ask about active learning is, why should we do it? After all, it's easy to lecture. Worksheets are uncomplicated. Traditional teaching methods are comfortable. Sure, student engagement is important, but does it really merit a complete change in the way that students access the material? Simply put, yes it does. The research on active learning proves its effectiveness. Let's take a look at some of the studies. In a 2014 article published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it was found that students who were given a traditional lecture had an approximate 65% pass rate on assessments, whereas students who were taught using active learning strategies had an approximate 80% pass rate on the same assessments, a 15% difference. In a class of 30, that's four or five more students who would be able to pass your class. Not only does active learning have an impact on each student, but also has shown that it is particularly effective for increasing the academic performance for diverse groups in your classroom. A 2011 article published in Science showed that students were able to close the achievement gap with their peers by nearly 50% with the inclusion of active learning strategies. In addition, multiple other studies have found that using those same strategies, especially in science class, completely eliminates the achievement gap between male and female students. The research on this topic points to one conclusion. Active learning is highly effective. It will increase your students' pass rates and create an environment that benefits all of your learners. So, take a step away from exclusively using the traditional methods and move toward active learning. We'll back your decision and so will the science. Wow, the 1980s. This is great. Yeah, it really is. Oh, hey, look, there's Brian's room. Let's see how he's doing. It looks like Brian's long lecture style wasn't as effective as he thought. Yeah, let's wait here for him until after class and then see if we can help him out. Hey, Brian. Hello, do I know you guys? Not yet. Huh? Uh, don't worry about it. We're actually here to talk to you about your classroom. Whew. It's been a long day. These lectures really wear me out and the students aren't engaged at all. That's kind of why we're here. We want to talk to you about active learning strategies so you can help get your students more involved with your class. Active learning? That sounds great. Yeah, let me tell you about one of our favorites. It's called the gallery walk. A great way to get your students thinking on their feet is by using a strategy called a gallery walk. Instead of sitting at their desks and answering questions or falling asleep during a lecture, students visit exhibits that help them answer questions in small groups. This strategy is student-centered rather than lecture-based and gives your students the opportunity to interact with the content. And all you'll need to set up your gallery walk is assigned groups and your walls. Here's an example of a gallery walk that introduces the Greek myth Arachne in a middle school literature class. You can modify the gallery walk for various subjects and grade levels. In this case, the teacher has tasked her students with answering the essential question, how does the story of Arachne explain Greek views of the natural world? To begin the activity, students move in small groups from station to station, responding to pieces of art, text, or graphics. At each exhibit, students explore the essential question using details from their observations, quietly discussing their ideas as they go. Students share their ideas on sticky notes and leave them for peers and other groups to read. After a set amount of time, the teacher directs students to move to the next exhibit. Students then respond to the new text in front of them, being sure not to repeat information that has already been shared on previous sticky notes. When the gallery walk is over, you can choose to have students answer the essential question in a short essay. Encourage the students to use their classmates' input from the sticky notes as supporting evidence of their ideas. Or, if you would prefer, have your students respond in a public speaking assignment, 
students could present each exhibit in their small groups, synthesizing the sticky note responses and their own ideas to discuss how each exhibit relates to the essential question. The social mobile aspect of the gallery walk makes this activity fun for your students. What could have been a dull essay assignment becomes a field trip in the comfort of your own classroom. And instead of preparing a lecture that your students may or may not listen to, you can sit back and watch your students teach each other. Now that's student-centered learning. You're excited about using new active learning strategies, right? That's great, but keep in mind, when you first begin these strategies, it can be a bit messy. There are going to be some classroom management issues that you may not have thought about. So let's take a look at three of the most common, volume, movement, and off-task students. Volume, students can be talkative. Students who are encouraged to speak during active learning can be very talkative. And that's fine, it's productive noise as long as they are speaking about your subject. But with all those voices going at once, the volume in your room is likely to increase. You'll need to let your learners know the acceptable level at which to speak with a demonstration. Do you want them to talk like this? Or maybe like this, but not like this. Set the expectation through modeling, then be prepared to correct and praise as the activity progresses. Movement. Anytime you have students up and around your room, you're going to have to make sure they're moving appropriately. This means that you break it down for them. Class, you're going to walk directly to the next location while keeping your hands to yourself. If you have the ability, it helps to provide them with a visual reference that shows them where to go. Should some students move in a way that's against your explanation, have all students freeze, remind them of the appropriate way to move, then resume. Do this as many times as necessary. Off-task students. Even though active learning is highly effective, students who are participating in it may be tempted to get off task. After all, they're talking and moving. It doesn't feel like a traditional class. You can counteract this behavior by making sure that students are being held accountable for their learning. This could mean completing a task sheet or responding to a question or developing a product. Whichever way you decide, they have to be working toward completing something tangible. It's also a good idea to incorporate timers into your activities so students will stay on task in order to complete their assignments within the allotted time. Active learning strategies can be a lot of fun and extremely valuable to your students, but keep in mind possible management issues that can be addressed before your activities begin. As long as you are patient, students will learn your expectations and you'll make the most out of your lessons. Active learning strategies are proven to enhance student engagement, increase assessment scores, and decrease achievement gaps in learning due to background and gender. If you've never tried active learning before, that's okay. You don't have to jump in with an advanced activity. Start small with something like one of the polling strategies. Once you begin feeling more comfortable, so will your students. Getting used to active learning can take time, but once you begin to use it regularly, you'll achieve great results. This month on Launch Your Classroom, we're going to continue our discussion on active learning. We're going to provide you with another useful strategy that focuses on students teaching each other. We'll have an expert interview about what to do when active learning doesn't quite work the way you expected. We have a trick about how to save time during lecture so you'll have more class time to use for these strategies. And we're going to have a fun segment about how you can stay physically active during the school year. So be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel to get all our upcoming professional development content. Thank you, and I hope you'll join us for the Q&A. Those strategies should really help Brian out. I think so too, but now it's time for us to get back to our time. Let's do it. It looks like everything's where we left it. Yeah, I wonder if, uh... Brian? Hey guys. You look so young. Thanks. It must have been all those years using active learning strategies in my classroom. It worked. What worked? Um, it's nothing. I wouldn't worry about it. Oh, 
Speaking of teaching, I found this old school newspaper when I was cleaning up my office. I wonder who those two guys in the back are. They look familiar. All right, thanks for watching and for the great questions we've been getting in the chat and through our professional development channels. We're going to answer as many of these as we can today. Remember, it's not too late to submit a question for the Q&A. If you have any questions about active learning strategies, put them in the chat and we'll answer them live. Joining us today for the Q&A is, as always, the host of Launcher Classroom Live, Kyle Pope. Kyle, welcome back to the present. How were the 80s? They were both radical and totally tubular. Wow, that checks out. And also joining us today is our Launcher Classroom Live co-host, Rachel Durant. Rachel, thanks for holding down the fort while Kyle was away in the past. Oh, they were big shoes to fill, but I was glad to do it. He is a tall guy. All right, let's take a look at our first question. This one comes in from Jasmine. I use active learning strategies about once a week. Is that enough? Kyle, what do you think? Hey, Jasmine, thank you for this question. Uh, before I answer it directly, I want to say that I think that you're probably using them more than you think. Um, because when we talk about active learning, it's engaging your students and it's having them become active participants within the lesson. So, you know, if you think about even having a class discussion, that's active learning. If you think having collaborative groups who are talking to one another about one, your assignment, that too is active learning. So you're probably doing a little bit more than you think, but if you're asking if once a week is enough, the, the short answer to that is no. You need to be trying to do it um, every day in every lesson as much as possible because the science bears out that when students are participating with their learning, they do better overall in class. Thank you so much for your question. All right, thanks, Kyle. We've got another one here. Uh, Rachel Arman wants to know, is it possible to create co successful collaborative groups with students at different academic levels? That's a really good question, Armin. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, you are going to want to create a collaborative activity that assigns different roles for different students so that each student can demonstrate their strengths. For instance, you might want to have a leader of a group. Um, you might have one of your more um, academically confident students lead the first few times um, while you've got a materials manager who goes and gets materials for the group and an encourager and a timekeeper and then switch those roles out over time so that each student gets to be the leader and gets to do different things. Not only are you going to give your students more opportunities to lead and um, take responsibility for their learning, you're also going to start erasing some of those lines um, that stand between students academically. This is a really good opportunity for students to excel in different areas and, um, and, and just kind of dismiss some of those preconceived notions of how, how bright they are. Um, they'll all get a chance to shine. Um, great question. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, <laughs> Kyle, I've got a question here from Mateo. I've tried a gallery walk before, but some groups took too long at their stations. How do I manage time limits if some groups are faster than others? Hey, Mateo, thank you for the question. Uh, hopefully you're using some, for, uh, uh, some sort of timing device when you do this, um, that you're keeping time and after so long you tell all groups to rotate. Um, but yeah, if you're having some groups that take a little bit long, the first question you should ask yourself is how much longer are they taking? You know, if it's something just like 30 seconds or maybe even a full minute, just go ahead and tack that on to the total time for your groups. I mean, that's not, that's not too much extra time. Um, but if it's becoming a major issue when you do these types of activities, maybe you want to switch up your groups a little bit and maybe pair some students who usually move way too fast through these with some students who are a little bit slower moving through these. Um, but if you prefer the groups the way that you have set them up, uh, you can also print out the materials that you would include in the gallery walk and give it to the slower groups individually so they can have more time to process it later. Thank you so much for your question. All right, thanks Kyle. I've got a question here from Freya. When I try active learning strategies, my students get too excited and talkative. 
how can I get them to focus on the actual activity? Rachel, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, um, hi Freya, you are pointing out one of the biggest concerns that teachers have about some of these really mobile active learning strategies. They think that they won't be able to get their students under control before, during, or after the activity. And there are two different ways of looking at this. I think one thing to consider is where this noise is coming from because there is such a thing as positive noise you know understand that sometimes what you're hearing is conversation about the instructional material um, or there might be some side talk but they are still getting more out of the activity than they would if you were lecturing so um, some of that is you kind of filtering through and seeing where this noise is coming from if it is negative noise there are a couple different ways to go about doing this uh, the first is procedure 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 you want to um, go through um, the acceptable ways of carrying out this activity and rehearse them and model them and, and do that several times before you actually conduct the lesson. Um, another thing would be to give them enough materials to take with them that they are always busy doing something rather than um, cutting up or um, engaging in side conversation. Do they have an assignment they're taking with them? Are you setting timers so they know that they need to complete this within a certain amount of time? If you create that immediacy, they're less likely to um, create the negative noise that might be concerning you. Um, thank you, Freya. All right. Well, thank you, Rachel. I've got a question here. Active learning can take up a lot of time, and I worry that I won't be able to get through all my curriculum. Any tips on saving time with these strategies? This is coming in from Lowry. Kyle? Hey, Lowry. Thank you very much. Yeah, we talked a little bit about the timers today, so that's certainly one thing that you can use to make sure that you're staying on track and you're keeping this active learning within a specific time limit that you have decided for your lesson. Um, another one is just being very selective with what types of active learning you choose. Uh, in the episode earlier, we talked about polling, for example. Um, polling takes very little time at all um, to just quickly ask your class you know, a question have them vote on it, find out their answer, you know, maybe 10, 15 seconds at the most. Uh, and you can work little ones in there through your lesson throughout the day. Also, on the other side of that, you know, you do have a lot of curriculum like you talked about, and sometimes it seems like the most efficient way to cover that is, is through lecture because you can dump a whole lot of information at once. But there are also ways that you can decrease your lecture time by getting the same amount of information out there. Um, and we're actually going to do a follow-up segment on that later in the month, so stay tuned. Thank you. Yes. All right. Got a question here from Giuseppe. How do I get students to take notes and do written activities while they are in the middle of an active learning lesson? Rachel? Good question, Gi Giuseppe. Um, I, I think that one way to do this would be to set up tables. Um, while students could be mobile and standing, um, they should have a place to park their materials anyway. Um, and they could take the time to write when they are at the table. Um, it, one thing you might consider is blocking out some time to, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, blocking out some time to have the students take notes either before or after the spoken uh, part. Um, a third thing to consider would be um, to give them an opportunity to take notes before the actual active learning and after so that that's not one more thing that they're negotiating. If you have a one-to-one -one classroom, you might consider letting them um, take their laptops or Chromebooks with them and then they can collaborate with those at tables as you go along. Thank you, Giuseppe. Okay, I've got another question here, more of a comment actually from uh, Evelyn. It would be great uh, to have some sample strategies based on the development of speaking skills. Do you guys have any suggestions for Evelyn for something like this? Anything that she could incorporate into her classroom to work on developing speaking skills? Yeah, we've been looking at this a, a little bit lately and um, with technology. Um, and we've talked about how you can get your students to use technology to record themselves practicing speeches. Um, they can be done through like voice memos on the phone, which are pretty readily available on, uh, you know, major, major phones. Uh, but you can also download apps for like iPads and stuff like that if you have them in the classroom. Um, students can record those um, alone by themselves with, you know, very little pressure 
and get used to doing that before they get in front of other students' um, speaking skills. They can also send those voice notes and memos to you um, on email so you can take your time and go through them and give them some pointers and tips that are individualized towards their own specific um, speaking skills. Rachel, did you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, um, I would add that we should never underestimate the power of a good think-pair-share. Um, you can have students work on something independently and then bounce their ideas off of a partner they trust, and then they um, can share their ideas with the whole class. They build their confidence slowly, thinking through their ideas first, testing them out on somebody they trust, and then speaking to the entire class. It's a great way to work on um, your, your speaking skills and your diction. All right, well, thanks, guys. Uh, I hope that helps, Evelyn. Uh, we've got one more question here today. This one comes in from Zlata. Uh, polling is a good way to check in with students, but not all of my students have phones and I don't have enough dry erase boards. What should I do? Kyle, what should Zlata do? Hey, Zlata, yeah, thank you for this question. So I love that you're thinking about polling. Polling is absolutely great. Um, if they don't have enough resources, then they can always share them. Now, I wouldn't say share phones, um, you know, that could cause an, an argument. But for your dry erase boards, you know, if you have enough for half the class, you can always draw, draw a line down the middle of the dry erase board and one student can write on one side and the other student on another. Um, they could also use just pieces of paper, especially if you're only doing a, a couple short polls. Uh, you know, th the classic, very traditional poll was how many students have done this, raise your hand. Um, that's still a possibility, although, you know, it's not the most engaging. But you can come up with hand signals and that types of things to make it a little better, uh, be it a thumbs up or holding up one or two, depending on if it's a yes or no or something like that, uh, to get a quick poll in your class when you have limited or no resources. So thank you so much for your question. All right. Thanks, Kyle. All right, everyone. That's all the questions we have time for today. Uh, Launch Your Classroom Live will return on December the 6th with a brand new episode, Reflective Teaching Practices. But that's not all. LYC will be releasing new content every Friday. So check back on November 8th for an engaging activity you can use with your own students. On November the 15th for another installment of our Ask an Educator interview series. On November 22nd for tips on using guided notes. And on November 29th for some wellness tips on staying active as a teacher. And today, Friday, November the 1st only, the entire Launch Your Classroom series is available to download free from Amazon.com. And remember, to stay up to date on all the free professional development that EPI offers, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel? And while you're at it, click the bell icon to receive notifications when we go live. From all of us here at Launch Your Classroom, have a great weekend. Take care, and we'll see you next time.